people who suffer from a mental illness are actually the high achievers, which I think is a segment that mm -hmm. people often forget about, is that on average, those who suffer from a mental illness have about a 10 point higher IQ than the general population. So what a lot of parents miss is that my child is doing great in school, my child is doing all these extra activities, swimming, you know, after school activities, on and on and on. However, there still could be an underlying mental illness issue happening. Um, they could actually have an anxiety disorder and, and not be able to let, and, ha and feel compelled to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. And it looks great because they're getting all the awards, they're doing well in school, and then all of a sudden they, they break down. They overload and they collapse. And then the parent is like, what just happened to my perfect child? And that's essentially what happened to us. We had Kenny was running on all cylinders. He was running at full speed. Everything was running what appeared to be perfectly on the outside. And literally within a matter of hours to us, the whole thing changed. And, we, and then, then he was diagnosed shortly thereafter and we found out what was actually going on with him. He had actually just simply overloaded on all the successes and it was just too much for him to handle and he collapsed. And so we went from having everything look like it was going perfectly well for Kenny to what do we do next? And um, we were literally kind of just out there not really knowing where to go, where to turn, who to talk to, because you don't call up your friends and say, hey, you know, what do I do to help my child? You know, he has a, he's, he's depressing, he's depressive, um, he's got an anxiety disorder. It's not really something you call up and talk to your friends about. And um, our first indication was that we thought it might be suffering from mononucleosis, so we basically took that initial, you know, uh, thought and, and that's really what Kenny told his friends um, that he suffered from mono literally for three and a half years. Um, that was really the only explanation you give people even if they kind of thought you were a little that maybe wasn't really a good explanation after a few years. Um, you didn't really feel comfortable coming out and discussing it. In fact, that the thing that Kenny suffered from the most actually or had the most impact on him was essentially that stigma that he really didn't even feel comfortable talking to a lot of his close friends about what was actually happening to himself. Um, and I think that was probably the, the single biggest problem that we, that we faced um, among its peers, among um, just um, the, the adults and the educators, all the people you interacted with. Um, you just never were sure how they would react, so really you just didn't say anything. You didn't, you didn't discuss it. Um, and that's the one thing we've learned, that it's extremely important that we feel comfortable as a society discussing uh, mental illness because um, it literally affects one in four of us worldwide, and it's the one subject that we don't discuss, yet it's much, it's more treatable than diabetes is. Um, it's, it's similar to the way cancer was years ago. Um, that was never discussed, and people literally died from the cancer because they weren't willing to have a conversation with their doctor and discuss what was happening to their bodies. Um, and we went through that with AIDS, where people wouldn't seek treatment because they were more concerned about how were people going to react, how were they going to judge me. Well, I think we've come to the point now where we really need to discuss, which, which is essentially the last and probably the, the, the biggest illness that covers the most people. Um, we need to start feeling comfortable as a society, having an open conversation, a constructive conversation, and not to be judgmental when people bring up the topic matter because it does affect so many of us and those conversations are very helpful and do help those people who are in need go and seek help, which is the first and biggest step of the process to getting better. For me, if I was able to just tell people that Kenny had an illness right up front, it would have made it so much easier because I would have had support of a, of a community. Um, when Kenny died, we had a huge support, the church, you know, friends, family, uh, a huge support. But up until that point, you couldn't share that with people and you felt isolated. And I think for Kenny too, Kenny, Kenny kept drifting away from his friends because he wasn't able to be in school. And he felt like he was getting further and further away. In fact, the week before he died, he said to me, Mom, I feel like I'm losing all my friends. And I just think, it's going to sound terrible, but people in society don't have time. You know, you're sick. I don't have time for you. And you could apply that to cancer as well. But I think, um, 
Oh, I think there needs to be a little bit more kindness towards those who are suffering from illnesses and um, just some more understanding and compassion. But for, for me, in regards to this journey, if I was able to open up and talk freely about Kenny's illness, I feel I would have been able to find resources earlier. Um, he, we would have had a little bit more help for him in school. Caitlin would have gotten more help. It just would have been just much, much better situation, you know. But the fact that you feel you can't talk openly about it, you know, you, you're, you're ashamed because then you start to, did I do something wrong? Did, was I a bad parent? Um, you really start to, to look closely at everything that you did in, in your life with your child. Did I do something wrong? Did I screw up? Did I, you know, did I screw him up? And um, I know now I didn't do that. I know now, you know, I, in my heart, I believe I was a good parent. I did everything that I could do for him to the best of our ability. Mental illness, has, it's genetic. You know, that, that's the other thing that needs to be talked about is the fact that it is genetic. You know, if people don't want to talk about it in a family, how do you protect the grandchildren? You, you, you know, I think it's important that families discuss it so that you can be on the lookout for it happening in future generations. I almost think that people don't want to talk about it because it could be them. You pretend like it doesn't exist and it can't touch me. That's my gut feeling for a lot of people, the people who don't want to talk to me because their but by the grace of God, could go me. And I think a lot of people don't get that. I think they think that, well, if I just think positive, I don't dwell in the negative, you know, it's gonna be all better. And that does help, but there is that biological imbalance of chemical, uh, chemicals in the brain that you can't forget about. Kenny once said to me, Mom, I wish you didn't love me so much. It would be easy to kill myself. So there's that biological component that I think is huge. And it can't be ignored. It's not just about feeling alone, feeling isolated. There's, there's a biological imbalance in brain chemistry that's happening in people with mental illness. And that's part of the issue is that they may not even realize that there's an issue, that they're different than someone else. So that's why it's so important as a society that we're aware of it as parents, that we get education so that we can see what these signs are and to know how to address it at a young age. Because the earlier you treat a mental illness, the, the greater chance you have of having success. I think one thing that people don't understand about mental illness is mental illness is extremely painful. And in reality, what suicide really is all about is, is, is not about ending life at all. It's actually about ending the pain. And so when you're looking at somebody who might possibly be at risk, um, you have to start looking at things like, well, what is the difference between being a little depressed and not having a good day and actually suffering from depression? being a little bit anxious about maybe giving a report and actually having an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really about degree. It's about the degree of the anxiety. It's about the, de the degree of the depression. Um, it's about is it, a, is it ch changing um, the way you live your life? Is it affecting you to the point where maybe you can't get up in the morning? Is it affecting um, you know, the way you relate with people? Are you, ha are you having trouble uh, relating to other people? So you, as a friend, can identify, hey, they're not just you know, feeling a little off today, they're actually not functioning the way that they would usually function. And it seems to be going on for an extended period of time. So it's the degree at which they're suffering and it's the, the length of time at which mm -hmm. they're suffering uh, where it moves from just having maybe a little bit of, a, of, of an off day and actually possibly having a, a real disorder that you maybe you need to get some treatment with. I think people feel they judge you as if it's a character weakness and not an illness. And that's what's wrong with society. 
It's that it has nothing to do with weakness of character. It's just it's not anything that we can control. You hear people say, you know, the power of positive thinking. You know, there's that book, The Secret. You know, you think positive, all these positive, wonderful things happen. I can't tell you how positive I was thinking, and I read that book. I watched the videotape, but there's only so much you can do. And I, and I do read on Facebook a lot of people, you know, these positive thoughts. And positive thoughts are important, but if there's that underlying illness, that biological imbalance of brain chemistry that prohibits you from having positive thoughts. That's what people have to understand. And I think a lot of people don't get that. I think they think that, well, if I just think positive, I don't dwell in the negative, you know, it's going to be all better. And that does help, but there is that biological imbalance of chemical, uh, chemicals in the brain that you can't forget about. One of, the, one of the stats that really surprised us a little bit, that took us off guard, was that nine out of 10 were not even aware that their loved one was at risk when they lost them. So 90%, I mean, that, that's an incredible number when you think about it, that they, they lost somebody, but they didn't even realize that the loved one was at risk till afterwards, and now they're looking back and saying, oh, now that I think about it, I can see the signs that were occurring, but it didn't really occur to me that that was actually somebody who was possibly in crisis. So it's really critical that we try to turn that number around. We want to make sure that we're catching you know, most of these signs that we're, that we're starting to identify you know, when our loved one is changing um, you know, the way they're, they're, uh, they're living their lives, if there's changes in their, in their personality, if there's changes in their sleep pattern, if there's changes in what they're doing as far as their work goes and things like that. Um, we really need to start at least opening it up to the idea, well, maybe there is an underlying illness at some point. And just because you have a mental illness does not mean you know, that that's the end of your life or that's, that's anything that's, that's, that's really as dramatic as it may sound initially because uh, a lot of our greatest inventors of all time, a lot of our greatest leaders, you know, like Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill, you've got all these wonderful people out there who live extremely productive lives and have managed their mental illness. So we need to understand as a society that that's not a life-ending event to realize that you've been diagnosed with a mental illness. That just means that you need to understand what's affecting your mind, what you need to do to help yourself, and how you need to modify what you're doing in your life so that you can function at a higher level and have a happier and better life. It's all about leading a productive and most of all, a happy life. Independent life. An independent life. <laughs>